Hello, everybody. I hope you've had a great week. We have some great things in our Come Follow Me readings this week in the Book of Mormon. We are in Helaman, chapters 7 through 12. So let's get started here. If uh, you go back to chapter 6, this gives a little context for what's going to happen in our, this week's reading. Verse 15 says, And it came to pass that in the sixty and sixth year of the reign of the judges, behold, Caesarum was murdered by an unknown hand as he sat upon the judgment seat. And it came to pass that in the same year that his son, who had been appointed by the, ju by the people in his stead, was also murdered, and thus ended the sixty and sixth year. So that's important because after him, until the Savior shows up, we don't know who the chief judge, judge is, save it be one example, which I'll give you in a little bit here. So Caesarum was the chief judge, gone. His son, gone. So who's the chief judge? We're not sure everything in there, which is important because we are now entering a corrupt time of politicians. I'm talking about Helaman, even though you might say something about today's world, but I'm not going to get political because that makes half of us mad. So no matter what I say. So with a little fun here, in Helaman chapter 7, we well, Helaman 639, maybe we should look there real quick. That just gives a little bit more that we know that the robbers have control over the government. So it is a bad time politically in the land of Zarahemla. So in chapter 7, verse 1, we know that it's the 60 and 9th years of the reign of the judges. That puts it about 23 BC. So we're close to the birth of the Savior, and many of these people will be around when the Savior shows up. Well, the righteous will be around when the Savior shows up. So Nephi returns. Remember, he's been out uh, proselytizing, teaching, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, declaring repentance amongst all the communities around the land of Zarahemla. Well, he shows up in the land, and uh, uh, he's not pleased with what he sees at home. First of all, verse 3 tells us when he is out in these other lands, they did reject all his words, insomuch that he could not stay among them but returned again to the land of his nativity. So he had a rough mission. Maybe some of us had difficult missions. Uh, I, I would be on my mission, and I would receive letters from some of my friends who were baptizing people every month. And we were lucky in Europe to baptize a person, let alone baptize people every month. So I understand what it's like to feel a difficult mission. Again, Nephi didn't choose his mission. The Lord gave it to him. Sometimes we have missionaries who are sent to one location and they get disappointed because whether it's visa or COVID or health reasons, they get reassigned and they feel like they haven't really started their mission until they're actually where they're at. I, I want to bring to those people, that remember that Elder Bednar talked about that in general conference where he said, you're called to serve to teach the location secondary. The location can change. Even when you get called to a mission, you're going to change locations from cities to towns to wherever you might be. Where we teach is not what's important. It's the fact that we are called to serve. So put that in perspective and gives a little bit of comfort and reminder. And if you're a missionary who's out there waiting to get to your real mission, uh, read Elder Bender's talk again. It was really, really insightful. Okay, let's go on to verse 6. This is helpful. It says, Now this great iniquity had come upon the Nephites in the space of not many years. How long does it take to go from a good, righteous people to uh, a state of iniquity? Well, if you check the footnote, it's interesting. It says, I eat six years. It gives the dates and it gives the reference back in Helaman 4 and also in Helaman 6 of what has taken place. Fun little historical context to study. I think the main principle you might want to uh, analyze here is how long does it take for a person to change from being good to 
making major mistakes? The answer is it's not very long. Sometimes we see youth or young adults very quickly make bad choices and no longer they have the spirit with them. They're really, really, uh, really struggling with that. In this case, we have an entire nation. And maybe we see that today around us. We see nations making good choices. And then in a very short time, uh, we have political leaders taking over uh, all over the, the world. I mean, how long did it take for Castro or, or Stalin or, you know, we see things in Venezuela or other places. It doesn't take long. So uh, good points to ponder there. Verse seven, I apologize to the writers of the Book of Mormon here, but this, I find this almost humorous. In verse seven, we see him saying, oh, that I could have had my days in the days when my father Nephi first came out of the land of Jerusalem, that I could have, jo have joyed with him in the promised land. And I, I read first Nephi and second Nephi and Jacob, and I'm thinking they didn't experience joy the whole time. Sometimes I think our perspective perspective is, oh, they always had it in the good old days. Well, sometimes the good old days weren't always that good. I, I just find that a little bit of humor. Uh, I apologize to all of them. And when I go to heaven and meet them, hopefully I will meet them and I can apologize to them in person. But I, I just want you to go back to Jacob chapter seven and Jacob's word in verse 26. And it came to pass that I, Jacob, began to be old and the record of this people being kept on the other plates of Nephi, wherefore I conclude this record, declaring that I have written according to the best of my knowledge by saying that the time passed away with us and also our lives passed away unto us like, a, like as it were unto us a dream. We being a lonesome and a solemn people, wanderers, cast out from Jerusalem, born in tribulation, in a wilderness, hated of our brethren, which caused wars and contentions. I mean, Jacob's reporting here that his life wasn't great. And so here they're like, oh, I wish I could be back in the days of Nephi. But anyway, uh, enough humor. Uh, so we'll set that aside. So in chapter seven here, we have a story of where Nephi gets on this tower in the garden. Rather than rehash the whole story, you'll read it. But I want to give something to you that I think would be very helpful. Go to YouTube and do a search in YouTube. Type in the pride cycle and then put brackets 1993. Uh, the Seminary Institute Department made a, a fun little video showing this story between chapter 7, 8, and 9. Uh, they reenact the whole story. Forgive the bad acting if that's a problem for you, but the story will be retold and you'll see things that will be helpful. Uh, I, I'm not always a fan of these stories and videos of reenactments, but this one I think will really help you grasp uh, a little bit about what's going on in a story that's jumping back and forth. We also notice in verse 9 that they do name, Nephi names the chief judge, Sezorim, and he even names his brother who killed him, Siantum. So that's in chapter 9 as well. So there's the story. So have fun with that story. Go to chapter 10 now. And in here, Nephi has a special, special story. Now remember, this is Nephi, son of Helaman. Helaman had his two sons, Nephi and his younger brother, Lehi. So this is that, that Nephi there. So Nephi has this special experience in verses really 4 through 12 where the Savior comes to him. Similar to what we might have called a calling an election or a more sure word of prophecy. But in this case, something additional happens in verse 7. Nephi is given a special power. Uh, it's called the sealing power. Uh, again, I hope with all of your readings, again, I'm, I'm just giving some historical context here. I want you to find the principles. Use the Come Follow Me book to find principles. But in this case, I hope you spend some time with your family or on your own, do a little study on what the sealing power means and who has had it. Use Matthew 16 uh, because there's sealing keys being passed there as well. And then we also know that in uh, Joseph Smith received that same sealing power in the Kirtland Temple, the power to seal things on earth as it is in heaven. In this case, though, in chapter 11, Nephi uses his sealing powers to seal the heavens up. In other words, it doesn't rain. And he says, instead of war, which we've had war after war after war, can we please have a rest from the war? 
and let's have a famine instead. It'll pick your poison. Whichever's going to bring humility to your soul. In this case, Nephi wants a famine, and they have famine. So let's just go straight to chapter 12 now, our final chapter in our uh, weekly reading this week. I want you to notice, uh, again, who is writing this? Uh, this is Mormon, abridging uh, these records. Chapter 12, we see him give, okay, I put this story in here for you. Let me tell you why. And if you'll know in verse 1, he starts out with, and thus we can behold. The middle of verse 1, we can see that. And now He's now making his commentary on the story. So make sure when you do the commentary, you make sure you understand the story. Verse 2, and we see at. And this goes on and on and on. Verse 3, thus we see. Verse 4, oh, how foolish, how vain, how quick. I mean, how many times do you use the word how? Verse 5, how quick to be lifted up, how quick to boast, pride, and so forth. And so he's giving commentary. And on here, this whole commentary is all about pride and the pride cycle. And you'll see how many, uh, how many times these people go back and forth through the Lord humbles them, and then they choose foolishness. Let me give you an example in here. Uh, Helaman, well, there's lots of examples in here. Uh, one example in chapter 11 uh, the famine causes, that's in verse 4, verse 9, the people had repented. Verse 3, the famine ceases. Verse 4, the rain should uh, fall up again upon the earth. Uh, verse 21, peace in the land. Verse 23, much strife. So at the very moment they get peace, strife takes place. What happens? The cycle repeats again. Verse 12, or excuse me, chapter 12, there's all those stories in there. Uh, and thus we can behold how false and how unsteadiness on the hearts of men are. I mean, the moment he doth bless them and prosper them, those who put their trust in him, you, we, uh, sorry, verse 2, yea, at the very, we may see at the very time when he doth prosper his people, yea, in their increase, and he talks about the blessings, go to the end of verse 2. They do harden their hearts and do forget the Lord their God. Interesting. So here's my suggestion. The famous talk on pride was by Ezra Taft Benson, and he called Beware of Pride. Uh, the great part about this talk is it's been so long-lasting. Uh, it was, I have the date here. Uh, again, you can watch it. Uh, if you go to, to, again to YouTube and type in Beware of Pride, uh, the talk is right there. Uh, and it's Gordon B. Hinckley who will read the talk because of President Benson's health. President Benson sits on the stand. He's right there with him. But President Gordon B. Hinckley, as his counselor, stands up and he reads that talk. It's a powerful talk. And then we even had uh, Elder Uchtdorf, when he was in the First Presidency, give a talk on pride and talked about this talk. So a powerful things to study this week. I hope you enjoy. We're now really close to just a few years before the birth of the Savior. Next week, we'll discuss Helaman 13 through 16. We'll finish up Helaman. And Samuel, a Lamanite, now will have to come and preach the gospel to these people. So we'll see you next week.